What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode eight of the Eyes and Ears podcast with your host, Brad and Elon. As always, I'm Brad and with me is Elon. Hi. How you doing, man? What's going on? Oh, too much grass growing too fast. It's springtime. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I live in Florida. You're on the West Coast out in good old Cali. So, yeah, yeah I imagine that it is, uh, yeah, it's about as crappy as it is there as it is for me here. It's like once a week, at least. Maybe sometimes yeah. twice. But it, you know, because it's also spring, uh, it's periodically, you know, raining still because April showers bring May flowers. And a lot of times it'll be rainy on the weekends when I usually have time to mow. So I'm overdue. So absolutely. Well, um, thank you for those that have joined us so far. We have a few comments here from Mike. Calibration is absolutely necessary. Timing, phase, SPO, preference, sub response, all play a part. Absolutely could not agree more, Mike. Um, cool. which we are gonna well, I guess that answers our question. So well, yeah, so, see you later, folks. Yeah, bye, bye. We're done with the stream. Thanks, no, Mike. Uh, yeah so spoiler alert we're gonna go over like why calibration is necessary that was more to just kind of start a conversation the title and everything um i'm a firm believer in calibration i believe elon is as well um but there's some things that are, are kind of like nice to knows or things that you may want to avoid and so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about a little bit i have some Quite a few REW measurements, uh, probably not going to go over all of them, but basically uncorrected responses with uh, for speakers and subwoofers versus here's what you can do with, you know, kind of the free stuff that's out there from like obsessive compulsive audio file, as well as like even some multi EQX stuff that I recently started dabbling into. So um, yeah, that should be fun to kind of go over and we'll, we'll kind of talk about the difference between like, do you want to correct above a certain frequency? What's the Schroeder, Schroding? Schrodinger's cat? No, it's a, the, the frequency at which the room starts to become more prominent in your frequency response. A lot of people don't like to correct above that, but that is all too personal taste as well as uh, just what kind of speakers you have. And uh, I'll kind of go over that too, because uh, we can, we'll actually be able to see in the measurements, we'll kind of break some things down. It's not going to be super measurement heavy, but I feel like uh, it's always like a nice show and tell to kind of show you what I got. And then we are going to touch on display calibration as well, which not a lot of people talk about these days. It's I think it's more elusive than uh, audio calibration. Audio calibration is kind of easier to talk about, I feel yeah. like, because... You can visually see, I could show you on a chart here, you know, if I, even if I just bump over to that real quick, I wish I had a scene set up for that. Oh um, you know, you can immediately see uh, if I hit this button here to show you, Whoa! you can visually see everything going on here uh, and we'll talk about this. So um, yeah, so just kind of give you a little preview there. That is my uncorrected surround left speaker so hey um but also just a reminder for those who are not uh tuning into this visually uh yes don't forget you can, to oh, yeah. download our podcast uh i i try and have that go out uh the following day uh, whenever we have a live stream so you should be able to download that as of tomorrow april 17th uh of, of your on your favorite podcast platform whatever that may be um, but also speaking of the podcast, uh, last week I mentioned all of our fans who are apparently in Denmark. Uh, once again, I was looking at the analytics today. Obviously, the United States is our uh, number one uh, Numero uno. demographic on who is downloading our podcast. But Denmark is still second, but a close third. Can you have any guesses? Uh, oh me! Uh, yeah, I like how you like. Uh, who else are you talking to? Um, uh, Norway. No, wait, this is Denmark. Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Canada, Ireland. Yes, in fact. Oh, there we go. Yes. 
Yeah, there so, we uh, go. Thanks for all you uh, north of the border downloading our podcast. Hey, eh? uh, pitter patter, keep doing it, huh? Because you did that accent so poorly, we've just lost most of our Canadian audience. So, oh, now they now they just are so smitten by my uh, feeble attempts. At, uh, your feeble attempts. So let's say hi to some people before we really dive in. I also apologize to people listening to this podcast since we are going to be looking at some measurements here. Um, you will not be able to see them if you're listening. I will try my best to describe them to you guys, um, but there really isn't a way for me to describe uh, a 20, 20 hertz to 20,000 kilohertz. Uh, I mean, we'd be here a, a long time if I went through every single frequency down to the 0 0.01. Whoa. So, yeah. But, so Mike is here. Double A is here. I don't, is it double A or just AA? We don't know. We don't know. Whatever you prefer. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, Kevin is here. Hey, Welcome, Kevin. Excuse me. Joel is here. Yay, Joel. Welcome, buddy. Um, Kurt is here. And we also have some other people. Oh, my God, there's too many people. Jeffrey is here. Thank you, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, you've been here every single week. If we had a shirt or something to send you, we would. <laughs> so, But we do not as of yet. Jordan is here. Hater hey, Cowboy Cinema. What's going on, man? How you doing? Hey. Uh, let's see. Lifestyle travel. By the way, if you if you guys have not checked out Jordan's uh, channel, Haterade Cowboy Cinema, he is around two thousand away from ten thousand subscribers. He's almost yeah, there. Um, he's trying to hit ten thousand before M Wave. So if you're not subscribed, go over there and hit that button for him. Um, that would be awesome. And honestly, uh, you know, shout out to Jordan because uh, he's doing a lot of good work. When I was when my channel was about that size, I wasn't pumping out as many videos as he's doing. As, and I just now started live streaming on my channel. So hats off to him because he has live streams every once in a while and is pumping out a bunch of videos per week. So kudos to you, he's, man. Keep he's doing putting it. me to shame, man. I, I need to get back on that. It just feels like every time I go to sit down to do the, the revamp edit, I get caught up doing something else yeah. and it's like oh uh, yeah so that is coming by the way um i also have some other stuff and the mini ds all that stuff is coming so don't worry you guys um but yes <laughs> i i lost my i like started looking at comments and then next thing you know jeffrey um, said he'll buy the shirt if we make it so please do we could use all the money this isn't <laughs> this stuff isn't free <laughs> Honestly, with that being said, I do like to dabble in graphic design and uh, like everything on my channel, logos and past logos. And uh, I do have a little bit of merch. Yeah. Um, everything I've done by myself. So I do like that kind of stuff. I just, I don't know. I haven't really had the desire to do it because not a lot of you kind of I honestly it. haven't, I haven't had one sale. Yet. Right, right. So wow. uh, yeah. the motivation is just not Other there yourself, because right? you bought nobody's it. getting it. Yeah. But if um, if anybody out there uh, has ideas for t-shirts or something, um, yeah, I'm I'm down to to make those and put it on my merch shelf or whatever you call it. So let me know. Hey, Jeffrey says that he does like your uh, shirt design deal and might put it on a B day or Christmas list eventually. Oh, that eventually okay. seems a little passive aggressive to me, but we'll let, oh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is awesome. I dude, I, 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 me and Elon talk a lot and I am kind of like, I, we both went to film school. Uh, Elon dived more down the graphic design hole after effects and stuff. I'm I'm kind of efficient at it, but Elon is on like on another level on another level. So I'll watch videos that he's done, and I'm just like, oh god, like how much I knew how I like me knowing how much time it took for him to create that. I'm just <laughs> like I I can't like I have trouble making one video a week, and he's putting out like two, and he's got like all these yeah. cool animations and stuff. Well, sometimes too. Yeah, um, yeah, that's... yeah. Sorry. Although, yeah, I, I've definitely yeah. toned down on the graphic stuff yeah. or the, the motion graphics but 
And Jordan, if Jordan is still here, can attest to this final cut. Their their plugins, their their animations are amazing. And they just they they're so awesome. Like I could not make the videos that I've been making without Final Cut recently. Anyway, um, that's neither here nor there. Uh, before we get started, Elon, do you have anything going on this week? Have you done anything fun this past week since our last live stream? Um, well, uh, I did finally finish the script today on the passive soundbar that I will be reviewing from Golden Ear. Mm. Um, so that should be coming soon. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking of maybe doing just an all in one video, but I think I'm going to break it up. So I'm going to do yeah. one for the soundbar, one for the subwoofer. And the in ceiling speakers are an ongoing story. So that's why I kind of wanted to break it up because I'm not even, even finished yet with that part of the system. Yeah. So once that is done because i'm actually going to have to send back the in ceiling speakers i have now because they're just too big <laughs> um, the the cutout itself is almost 12 inches in uh, circumference and or no diameter yeah 12 inch diameter and man it's just very large but i mean yeah. it's their flagship in ceiling speaker the HDR 8000, which when I was ordering it from Golden Ear, I was like, yeah, man, of course I want to go with the flagship, best one, yeah. It's massive. Stupid, stupid me. You know, I should have gone in the attic first to see if there was any <laughs> obstacles. Oh, no. Yeah. So that's why I'm going to have to send them back and get the downsized or the, the step down, was the, which is the HTR 7000. Yeah, and the, the cutout for that is only nine inches in diameter, mm. which actually does work with all the various pipes and other things that are in the way up there. I'm not envious of you there, man. Like it's uh, when I, yeah, looking back, uh, even doing like like normal things to the house and going into the attic to kind of like see about running speaker wire. Dude, there's just so many obstacles you have to go over which is yeah. part of the reason i i installed the drop ceiling because i was like i can just yeah. route everything up through there i don't mind having like you know black uh black cable channels coming down it kind of blends into the room and the aesthetic so um yeah anything you can do to kind of like help yourself in that regard um mm -hmm. yeah so uh, yeah, for me, I've been working away on the uh, revamp edits, uh, but not before my wife and I, well, kind of back, like, kind of, basically my time is spent doing that, or has been spent doing that, and also um, binging the Fallout show with my wife. Uh, we had a comment. Also, yes, Oprah, people Oprah Winfrey said, thank you for the IMAX DTS update. Um, you're welcome uh so yeah music jewel to answer your question um i i watched the whole thing we watched it over the course of like three days um, which is rare for me i don't watch shows like that like um, that I watch, fast, you mean? yeah never like i'm normally like an episode maybe two a day mm -hmm. um but this is like we just kind of like pounded it out man we were okay after, i will say this the first episode i was kind of like <sighs> I was I was kind of on the fence for the first two. I I enjoyed it, but at, at points here, like the acting was really strange to me uh, for a certain character named Maximus. Um, I, I was trying to figure out where they were, like how they were trying to, like basically how they were trying to match the games. Were they trying to do this or were they trying to do, like do that? It felt like at some points they were trying a little too hard. That's just my opinion there um but it, i don't know what happened at the uh on the third episode but man i was hooked like i was like i don't want to yeah. stop i don't want to stop watching um <laughs> it, i love the games um i was even I, except for 76 i don't think many people enjoyed 76 i didn't really want a multiplayer fallout like that i wanted more of just like me and like another friend like not like a bunch of other people and still kind of like a single player contained story um 
uh and that's not what 76 is but um mm. uh, i did enjoy fallout 4 fallout new vegas fallout 3. yeah i really uh i thought the show was great they really nailed the vibe of the game um yeah. of the games i should say and yeah walton goggins as cooper um i can't remember his last name man the ghoul he just he steals the show i mean he yeah. it, what i like is they didn't they didn't overuse him either like they could have just made him like the main character throughout the whole thing but no it was like a you know to avoid spoilers it was it was a it was telling the tale of like him and maximus who's part of the brotherhood of steel or trying to be part of the brotherhood of steel and then uh lucy the vault dweller so like it's yeah. kind of like ha like their separate stories and how they kind of intertwine and come together and it's just it was told really well it was still the show's definitely weird but the games are weird yeah. too yeah so uh yeah i definitely highly recommend it even if you're not a fan of the games uh there are a lot of easter eggs obviously if you're fans of the game um i wasn't i wasn't too overly impressed with the atmos mix on it um did there you were, watch it in the theater yeah, yeah yeah there were moments where there was some ambience um the lfe really kicked uh, with some of the gunshots uh but overall it was it was a very i felt it was a very front heavy mix it wasn't a mm. there's nothing that really stands out to me in terms of that show where i was like this is demo material like it there, there was a couple times where where it kind of came to life but uh yeah i found um the last of us to have a more dynamic atmos mix on that one hmm. um yeah. when i watched that i think yeah yeah sorry it's been a while it's been a while too many <laughs> shows too many shows um but yeah i'm uh curious to see kind of where they go with it apparently it's gotten universal praise um it is it, it's up there with the best video game ad adaptation uh i would hmm. say um you know in, in terms of like faithfulness yeah, I mean, this is a this is a independent story set in the universe. It's not a, like following anything really in the game. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm really a fan of it. But that yeah, that's uh, I mean, it's completely off you know off the topic of what this whole live stream is about. But I just kind of <laughs> wanted to mention it if you guys are on the fence about it. Um, shame on Amazon for locking Dolby Vision behind their new paywall. <laughs> what? Like, yeah, you don't you don't get any of that if you if you, uh, like. I'm still getting Atmos and HDR, which I'm like, but I'm also getting ads. So, I and I have Amazon Prime, so I have to pay like they want me to pay four or five dollars extra. So I was like, nah, I'm good. Per month. Uh, yeah, yeah, per month. Um so yeah uh, uh lifestyle travel to answer your well, uh, answer your question um it is a uh 7.4.4 setup um and yeah i just i i mean there were some app i didn't find it atmos heavy i guess maybe I, maybe that's just me or maybe i was tired this is why i don't do show reviews <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> I, don't, I don't have it like yeah i, I mean there's nothing that really stood out to me. I'll just say that much. Um, yeah. I watch probably way too many demos uh, to, to, you know, it's like, it's hard to, to go, yeah, this is really active. And then you play ready player one and you're like, well, my, my face just got blown off by the, the top fronts and top rears in my system. Yeah. So, um, anywho. So yeah. Um, still an enjoyable show. Uh, it's a, it's a great show that I would definitely recommend. Um, hopefully they'll keep going and, uh, yeah, cool. So 20 minutes in, you want to talk about the, the main topic of the, uh, now nah. <laughs> like, nah, let's just end it here. No. Uh, <laughs> so just to remind people, if you're watching this live, um, if you have a like topical question as we're going over stuff, like we're talking about a certain thing in terms of calibration or whatever, uh, then post the TQ, followed by colon and then a question colon's not as important as the tq it just allows us to kind of see it flag it um show it right away if we can um opinions are always welcome even if they're wrong uh, <laughs> I, I need to take that out of there but it's funny to me i don't know it is because then it, it, it is who cares right who cares 
<laughs> people take things too seriously. This is all fun. Yeah. Um, if you have a general question, put a GQ in front of the uh, question, and uh, we will try to get to it uh, by the end of the stream. Normally, if we have any downtime or whatever in between, uh, someone has to you know step away for a second, and we're we, you know we we can try to answer those general questions you have. We typically do try to answer those at the end. And then finally, uh, super chats, super stickers. They are activated on both of our channels. So wherever you're watching, you will be able to support us if you so choose, if you so desire, not required at all to get your question answered. It's just a way for you to show your support for us. And we greatly appreciate it. So thank you guys so much for joining us. Yeah. Super chats are required if you want to be super cool. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I kid. You do. Um, you do. So go ahead. Just uh, one, one quick thing before we dive in. Uh, somebody mentioned my IMAX enhanced on Disney Plus update. Um, for those of you who didn't see my video, or A, go watch it. Uh, just dropped yesterday. Um, but I, I got an email from my DTS contact saying that IMAX enhanced audio will finally be coming to Disney Plus May 15th. Yes. Um, so that includes the Queen Rock Montreal concert film, as well as 18 Marvel Cinematic Universe films. Um, so I'm excited for that. Hopefully I can get it to work. And if it does, then I'll be doing some tests on it. Um, I mean, unfortunately, I don't have like early access or anything. So I'll just be like with the rest of the world and uh, just being able to test it yeah. from May 15th and on. That's, so. that's super cool. Hopefully I'm, I can get a video out pretty quickly after that. I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on that because um, I think we had texted about this earlier and it, it was, or not like today, but like just in general talking about it. I, I do wonder what the difference will be since we're still dealing with lossy compression yeah. over the internet. It'd be different if they were like, hey, IMAX, uh, D, like IMAX enhanced DTS tracks are are the full bandwidth stuff you know that that would be something i would be interested in because right now dolby atmos is still lossy on pretty much every uh streaming service so yeah, yeah we'll see we'll see will there be a difference i don't know who knows but uh, when i was at ces in 2023 the dts rep sven said yeah. that it is even less discernible um compared to you know if you're watching it on a 4k blu-ray or something right, right less discernible than if you compare streaming atmos to disc atmos so what does that yeah. mean i don't know but we'll yeah. find out and lifestyle travel brings up a great point that's why physical media is still needed and i 100 percent agree mm -hmm. i uh you know, I watch things streaming for convenience only. Um, if I am serious about a movie that I really want to see, I will wait for the 4K Blu-ray. Yeah. That's, uh, I, I have no, I'm in no hurry to watch this stuff. I don't do reviews on my channel that are time sensitive or anything. Uh, if companies want to start sending me like pre-release copies to do a quick blurb on the channel, but I'm okay I'm like sure you know <laughs> give you a little three yeah. four minute review okay yeah sure but uh yeah normally i'm waiting just like everybody else if i don't get to i typically don't go to the theater much because it's just so expensive so yeah um and anyway. uh my reasoning for physical media is when the zombie apocalypse happens i'll at least have entertainment when the internet Un goes down yes until the so. disc rots and becomes a zombie itself <laughs> so <laughs> Well, that's, uh, I always love when I accidentally hide Google Chrome instead of the web browser I meant to, add, uh, <laughs> meant to hide. So awesome. Well, let's go ahead and dive into it. Thank you guys for being patient with us. And basically today we're going to go over calibration. Why uh, is it necessary? I mean, spoiler alert, we kind of went our, uh, over that already. Uh, I believe it is. Um, Elon, I believe. He thinks it is as well. Not to put words in your mouth. Do you? Do you? Are you a 
religious person when it comes to audio calibration? Uh, yes, I take the sacrament every week and pray to my home theater gods. I mean, you showed me your shrine, <laughs> and uh, I accidentally uh, showed that comment instead of starring it. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, you showed me your shrine, and it's pretty. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> pretty awesome um so no so i told you that in confidence well i have pictures now so blackmail (laughs) Blackmail, is coming yes there we go so basically i want to kick off this by say like by basically kind of trying to answer the question what is cal like what is the point of calibrating your system and it's not really like a one like one answer to that question type of thing it's multiple reasons actually and we're not just talking about audio but we're kind of focused on that mainly but the main reason uh or one of the main reasons is to get the most out of the equipment you have in the room that you have it in right uh there are ways to uh minimize uh issues and maximize the output of your system be it frequency response or amplifier power anything like that um, typically out of the box things aren't where they may need to be um, that uh, applies to displays as well same with speakers subwoofers you know if you are a fan of my channel uh, you know I've done many DSP tutorials in the past I'm working on a new one kind of with the updated interface if you bought four subs and you just throw them into a room and you You just don't even really adjust the volume. Just put them all at like 75%. Chances are, even if you have four subs, you're going to run into issues where they're canceling each other out um, across your listening position. So their calibration is especially important. And what does that even mean? Like, what are we, like, what is calibrating? It's just basically getting your speakers and your subwoofers and display to some type of reference point right and that could be the industry standard it could be your personal preference you may have been in this hobby for a long time and uh, you know what you like and so you calibrate to that there's really no like when we hear people talk about oh i listen to movies that reference volume well what's reference you know they are they talking about studio reference where like at the mixing stage that that's the volume that they mix the movie at Or are they talking about their reference, which is maybe different? So it basically is just a way to uh, get your system performing at its kind of maximum potential with your preferences applied or or kind of adhered to. Um, Some people like to calibrate to like just everything flat, right? And what does that mean? You know, flat is basically if you look at a frequency response chart um, here, I'll bring this up real quick so we can kind of kind of see this. Um, If we look at a frequency response thing, this isn't a frequency response, by the way. This is just a uh, I'm lying. (laughs) (laughs) I'm lying. Uh, Here we go. So if we were to look at like just this basically this is a flat response this green line here hopefully you guys can see that it's just a flat um response that means that all the bass the sub bass and all the the highs and everything and sorry this is kind of like you know frequency response 101 calibration 101 this basically means that every frequency across this spectrum of frequencies is going to try to hit this target line here and that basically means that everything is even everything is balanced but if you're not used to listening to this and especially if you're listening to it at a lower volume this sound this can sound very dull to most people would you mm-hmm. i mean would you say that elon i mean you kind of have a kind of a background in audio mm-hmm. uh do, like the first time you heard like a flat frequency response do you remember what your reaction was to it like even um, if it's headphones or whatnot it just sounded uh well especially bass there was almost no bass um yeah because because yeah typically i mean it you'll when you're dealing with um studio monitors as opposed to speakers studio monitors are supposed to be as flat as possible with their frequency response because you want those references to be just dead even so you're you're basically hearing exactly what you're hearing 
Like, does that make sense? Like, yeah, you, you don't you don't want to add, you don't want to add anything. You don't want to have any coloration to it because when somebody else plays it on their system, they might have a little bit like way too much bass coming mm -hmm. because maybe your studio monitors had a little bit of bass lacking, right. so you had to kind of compensate for that. So, so yeah, the the only time you're gonna want to have something that flat is when you're dealing with studio monitors and you're like mixing music or something. But when in the case of home theater, it's totally different. And I, yeah. I'm sure you're, I'm and, sure you're going to hit on this. Yeah, and there there are preferences. Um, we also have a, a special guest in the live stream, Mr. Joe Intel, ladies and gentlemen. Someone, it, it, you know what? Someone mentioned Magic Beans like five minutes ago and yeah. by osmosis, Joe appears. <laughs> It feel it, it, it seems so. Welcome, Joe. Thank you for the uh, thank you for like catching us on the live stream. So cool um, to see you here. Um, <laughs> yeah, so his the, the hair on the back of his neck. Started. Yeah, he said that if someone says DSP and calibration three times in the mirror, he pops up. So <laughs> this is like the was it the Bloody Mary? Yeah, whatever that whole yeah or uh, candy is real. Can <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> right calibration bingo music jewel says um but yeah so to talk about to kind of go into that a little bit um so to me what calibration means to me is knowing where that reference point is like what are the studios kind of mixing these movies to right knowing where that is means that regardless of any sub or speaker that i have i know what my personal preference is so I can adapt that, knowing where that reference point is, I can adapt any sub or speaker system to what I know will sound good to my ears. And that's the other thing that people don't kind of realize is everybody's ears, just like their eyesight is slightly different, right? Some people hear things a different way. My wife has way better hearing than I do, um, you know, because just I, I have some hearing issues from playing drums many years without hearing production when I was younger. Always wear earplugs. Maybe, maybe she should take over your channel. That's true. But I, you know, I'm not an audiophile. I just like, I know what I like. I definitely, uh, I'm more probably more of a videophile. Um, yeah, yeah. Than anything. But I do, I do know what, what sounds good to my ears. Uh, but she could probably hear more of the high frequency stuff. I think my hearing starts to roll off at around 13 to 15K. After that, it just kind of becomes like a, you know it's just like yeah. <laughs> i can't hear anything uh oh Aww. dang it keep oh we got a uh a super chat joe thank you so much keep doing your thing fellas everyone support thank these guys joe. thank you joe we really appreciate it buddy thank you um uh, i've actually been watching joe's videos recently because i just got multi eqx so i've been kind of doing deep dives into that and on yeah. on my off time free time very limited these days uh, i've been watching videos of his to kind of catch up on uh some things that i missed and uh i gotta say man it's uh, that import target curve from rew is a game changer um i should preface that by saying that odyssey did supply me with a copy so i didn't pay for it um so there will be videos coming on that and tutorials uh but yeah if you're kind of on the fence um I'm releasing a video soon with my general first impressions and they're largely positive but joe thank you man so much for the the super chat yeah. really appreciate it um what was i saying i forgot was i talking about the flat preferences response. yeah so there's like flat frequency response which is basically here's 75 db across a flat uh plane i could probably show my uh screen again that might help hey Unless you're listening on the podcast. Yes. <laughs> Guys, if you're listening on the podcast, what we're looking at right now is a flat green line. Um, it's just hanging out, chilling, doing nothing. From 20 hertz um, to 20,000 hertz. Yes. And uh, Joe, I am 100% for getting together and messing around with Magic Beans and MQX, unless that's a euphemism, of which I am not. <laughs> it's both. Anywho. It's what? Okay, so uh, basically, here's this flat line. You guys are watching. You can see it. 
Um, if you can't, we got this, the, uh, you know, it's just a, basically a flat line. And then um, there are a multitude of house curves and ways to make this sound better. And I just realized I only have uh, my subs open right now. Uh, so we're going to open up a bunch of other measurements here. Whoa. Forgive me. Go. Look at it. Look at all these. You tell I, I really thought this through, didn't I? It's so fun. Rainbow. I know it's still going. It's still going. Oh, shut up. Shut up, Rumi Q wizard. You're drunk. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, we had that flat line that went somewhere, and I don't know. Uh, there it is right there. And basically, this is probably if you calibrate everything to this, like you're trying to basically get your subs, like say this is my EQ sub, right? or subs, I should say. This is a relatively flat line. It's a little a little boosted here, but I can bring it down pretty easily to match that. That's going to basically ensure all of these frequencies are at the same volume, but that might not necessarily sound the greatest, especially if you're listening at anything below 75 dB. Most of us don't listen at that level on our receiver. Most of us, I, I don't. Yeah, I'm, I I'm normally minus 10 to like minus 15. So what can we do to mitigate that without using something like dynamic EQ, which is like Odyssey's kind of way of combating that as the volume reduces, the the bass is, is boosted and the surrounds are boosted and the, and the, the height channels are boosted. Uh, that can cause some kind of wonkiness when it comes to certain movies and games, especially games are, are kind of, it really just makes those surrounds super prominent and they kind of overpower the mains. So an easy way to do that is to throw in a house curve, which you could see right here. Now this is this is pretty much what I use these days. Um, if we see here, instead of flat, it is. Get rid of this. Uh, you can see it's not super flat, down to ten hertz. From you know, which my subs actually do. Um, this is an old calibration here, um, but my subs can actually hit down to eight hertz. Believe it or not. Um, yeah. Molt uh, or like ultra sub infrasound. That's what it see. This is right there. Infrasound. Um, no, so like it's slightly boosted here at uh, at ten hertz, and then as we start to kind of slope down, I don't know why that this is not working here. Let's uh, let's use this. Use the mouse. Um, so as we as we kind of get closer to the uh, this point here, you see it kind of tapers off. Um, and this is not the same curve that I used in the old mini DSP videos. This is a curve I tend to apply over my entire frequency range. Um, so this is just basically the base is boosted a certain amount. Um, not too much. If we look here, we're only up 3 dB at 10 hertz. Uh, but then if we kind of zoom out and go to the whole frequency range, you see that blue line. It's just kind of a constant slope all the way down. So basically this is going to boost the base a little bit while cutting the highs over time. Um, and this creates kind of a, a more uh, full sound to our ears, to my ears at least. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a, a curve that I actually um, found while following one of Obsessive Compulsive Audiophiles uh, videos. Um, and he has since gone to start using, I think his Odyssey 1, uh, let me see if I can find the curve, it's in here somewhere. His Odyssey One calibration actually, yeah, uses the Doctor uh, Doctor Tool Carvet Curve or Target Curve Carvet Turve. Jeez, um, <laughs> got more beer over here. So you can see that curve is slightly different, um, and this is again what comes down to personal preference. Whichever one you want to try to target is your own personal preference, especially if you know like what you know what you like. And the the great thing is is with like modern things like multi EQX, um, <laughs> multi EQX, and things like that. This is these curves are really easy to implement. Um, so yeah, it's really you know this is kind of on the more advanced side. This is like you've you've you're not happy with what Odyssey is doing to your sound, and so you want to go a step further and really dive in. Um, and that's something that is kind of really hard to do with Odyssey um, yeah. by default, like just, uh, you know, with what's built into your receiver. Um, and we have another super chat, believe it or not. Kevin, thank you so much. He says, you guys are making 
this too complicated. Uh, just plop the speakers anywhere, run room correction, and you're done and ready to enjoy the movies. Wink, wink. Honestly, calibration is important, but a pain in the ass. I'll say it for you, man. It is a pain in the ass. Um, I do. It really is. I do enjoy this stuff. Uh, however, there does always come a point, and I think anyone out there who's kind of a someone who tweaks their system, um, there just comes a point where you want to stop tweaking and just enjoy it. Mm-hmm. You know, at the end of the day, it's like, what's the point of like calibrating, like literally bringing your measurement microphone out every single day, which is kind of what I do when I'm learning something new. I mean, it is technically my job, right? That's, I'm not probably considered an average consumer at this point because I just, you know, I'm always like, okay, I need to practice this for a video or I need to test this out for a video. It's like, there's always like a, another motive other than just me like bringing the measurement mic out, you know? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, but I agree, man. Uh, it's Calibration is very important, but it, it can be a pain in the butt, which is why um, as the time, like as basically the times have changed, we're no longer in the early days of like when Odyssey first came out. Um, it really like, it's changed so much where even even kind of, diehard people who were going to die on the hill of like, I never, I never EQ anything above, you know, a thousand, uh, thousand Hertz or 500 Hertz or 300 Hertz are now just kind of letting Odyssey and Dirac kind of do their thing. I think even like Matthew Pose and Gene Della Sala are, are just kind of letting Arc Genesis and, uh, Odyssey multi QX, whatever they're using, just kind of EQ the whole range instead of, you know, up throwing that curtain up which by the way if you guys don't know a curtain is basically you're just limiting the amount of correction that you're telling odyssey or dirac or anthem arc is it arc is it arc genesis arc genesis yeah yes i don't have i don't have access to that so i'm, I'm constantly trying to remind myself what it's called um <laughs> but yeah you you basically say hey stop here and don't eq or do anything above a certain point um okay. and you could do the same thing with the subs uh, but thank you, Kevin, again. Uh, I really appreciate it, buddy. Thank you. Uh, and I h- agree but, uh, 100%. One thing to note, though, is that, um, you know, you might think that you want a completely flat frequency response or at least something resembling just a flat line. But the reason it's going to be a slope downward from... 20 hertz or you know zero hertz to twenty thousand hertz it's not just because you want to it's not it's not because we're bass heads and we just like to boost our bass no it's just because the energy behind low frequencies is so much more than high frequencies so that's why you're just generally going to have that slope because just by nature, those low frequencies are going to produce so much energy that it's going to be the top of the slope. And then it just yeah. gets weaker and weaker as you go down with high frequencies. Because that's why low frequencies shake your room and uh, you know, rattle stuff if things aren't, you know, properly, you know, secured. Yeah. Because it just has so much energy behind it. You know, you're not gonna get that reaction from really loud high frequencies. I mean, sure, they can, you know, opera singers can break crystal glass or whatever if they, you know, have yeah, the same they really resonant those. frequency as the glass itself. But so that's possible. But obviously, typically, you're going to feel it with those low frequencies because they just generate so much energy with those wavelengths being so long. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That's why you have that downward slope. Just, FYI, if if people didn't realize that. Thank you, thank you for for just interrupting me. I appreciate that. Oh, no, <laughs> no, no. You you do provide like that insight that uh that like I you know sometimes we get lost in the in the shuffle of all this stuff and we we lose sight of like the end game. Like I you know I swore, and this is this is me. I'm gonna highlight this comment because I swore I read somewhere or watch the video where Gene was like, yeah, multi EQX. I, yeah, I just kind of let it do its thing. I could be wrong on that. It may have just been Matthew Pose. I, again, please don't take anything I say here 
as like gospel or verbatim to what they're doing. Um, I'm just maybe trying to remember something I read or heard in one of the videos. Um, I'll have to ask Gene uh, directly. Um, I'll text. I'll text him right now. Um, we talk all the time, uh, <laughs> sometimes. But uh, yeah, so maybe uh, yeah. I I generally used to recommend a curtain, but it really just depends on each person and and their setup. Uh, we'll kind of dive into some measurements about why. Like I tend to just set a target curve and and let everything go that route only because my speakers and heights are different speakers or like my main speakers yeah. and heights are different speakers. So like right. you'll, you'll see in the measurements, the before and after of the, it's like the heights are just so prominent. Um, but I did see some topical questions. I want to um, maybe uh, look at here real quick. Uh, let's see here. Da -da -da. Uh, so top of question, is that why Odyssey turned down my sub? My hearing is just not trained. <laughs> no, Odyssey has a tendency to really just turn down your, like, yeah, that, that's a, that's a common complaint with Odyssey in general. Yeah. Um, if, if you let Odyssey kind of do everything, uh, itself, like if you don't go in and say, I want to do this or I like what I want to change this, uh, you know, I noticed like when running multi QX or even like, you know, through the Denon or the Odyssey multi EQ app on my iPad before I had multi EQX, it would have me adjust the sub volume. And I had already set it to like 75 dB flat, like using a mini DSP and, and, you know, looking at like Remy Q wizard measurements. And then it was, it followed that line almost to a T. It wanted me to reduce it another like 5 dB to be within the green, the top part of the green line. And even then, it was kind of like it would flash over occasionally, and I was like, "Like, uh, I'm not reducing this anymore," um, you know. But it, it at, after the fact, I always end up like boosting the sub channel or or whatever a little bit because I, or or just uh, like removing the correction altogether. Um, it just depends on, you know, if I find that the correction, especially like with multi EQX, I found the correction doing it all manually with Remy Q is there anyway. Uh, to not to just kind of not really do much, so I just kind of left it. I didn't even touch it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Joe brings up a good point. Um, that a curtain is a good idea for most auto, for most auto room correction because they do a bad job correcting the frequencies above the transition region. Schroeder frequency. Which is That's what, what I was we were alluding to. Earlier. Yeah, yeah. I was trying. I was trying to say, um, yeah. It's a. It's definitely worth experimenting with. I'll say that some people might prefer it. Some people might go. I need this. You know, to. I, I just want it correcting the whole thing. I don't want to worry about it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I what I could do, I guess, uh, for my speakers is for the top, like the the height channels. Is have them fully corrected because they're. I think I think I, if we look at the the chart um, in a bit, I think my height channels after like three or four k, they're mm -hmm. boosted by like eight to ten dB over like everything else. Like they're way higher. Like wild. It, yeah, yeah. It's it's weird. I don't understand why, but hmm. it's probably just the speaker. But um, but yeah, that is a very that is a very good uh, a very good uh, advice, Jack. Man, words tonight are hard. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, again, I think part of like why videos are so popular, like the like tutorials, like you know, mini DSP, uh, Odyssey stuff like that, is people don't they don't. Like they're just not familiar with it. They're not. I don't want to say like they lack the education or whatever. It's not. It's just that there's so many moving parts with that stuff that they really just want someone to say, "Hey, here's what you need to do. This is all it takes. Go do it, and you'll have a good time. Like you'll you'll yeah. end up with a good result." Because this stuff, like this stuff, can be a lot of stuff can be easy, but it is a lot of like got to do this little thing and then this little thing and then that little thing and those three little things add up to like this kind of bigger picture type deal um which 
you know, I'm more than happy to like provide the tutorials for people and hopefully they, <laughs> they, uh, they're easy for people to follow for the most part. Um, yeah. I mean, like when I was in audio engineering school, I mean, it, it was, it, it was a conservatory, but it was mainly focused on music mixing. Right. Right. Um, so we didn't deal with a lot of surround sound almost at all, really, uh, just very, very briefly during my time there. And I mean, that's exactly what they said. They said music mixing or stereo mixing is an art form. Surround sound mixing is a science. So like, I get it. Not a lot of people are into the science or really caring about why does it have to be this way? What is the science behind it? So they just want to have somebody tell them and show them what to do. So I, I totally yeah. get it because I yeah. mean, honestly, it is, it, it, it is you kind of got to get nerdy and and really like get down to the nitty gritty science of it and why you need to do this and that and yeah it takes time and takes you know you got to do your homework yeah and that actually ties into another topical question that we have from joel um how far down the rabbit hole do we go with calibration after room correction should we look at etc impulse response waterfalls etc um and he's also kind of adds on to that at what point to tie into last week's topic are there diminished returns with tweaking and i think that's a very very good point mm. because theoretically you can tweak indefinitely right yeah, you're really. always going to be able to like maybe maybe you squeeze out another 0.1 percent from your subwoofers or, or system um but there is a kind of law of diminishing returns when it comes to this stuff and i'd say for most people um, in most room correction softwares, unfortunately, outside of like Arc Genesis, uh, for most people, the, the only thing that, that really kind of needs to be tweaked post Odyssey from like, for the kind of the general guy, general person is the, the crossovers, right? Like they're always typically set them far too low, um, to have a smooth roll off between the speakers and the subs. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if you want to go further, also a lot of these room corrections, even even uh, room correction softwares, even Dirac, um, don't really set the distances properly to time align the speakers at like the main listening position correctly. And you can look, you can actually do that with the impulse responses, and you could see those. Like if you if you basically ran everything, like ran Odyssey Dirac. Uh, did measurements of the full system after that each speaker and you looked at the impulse responses of each speaker you'll notice that like it, like say you use the center channel as your timing reference mm -hmm. you'll notice that like some of the speakers just are not hitting like are not arriving at the same time and this is actually something i i uh picked up on from uh, obsessive compulsive audio file to his tutorials mm -hmm. um and basically doing that small little tweak of like aligning those impulse responses by adjusting the distance in your receiver he's got videos on like how to do it yeah. um i'll probably cover it in a video later down the road that kind of i was actually amazed at what that did for the presence of the system right mm -hmm. like the the sound quality that came from just doing that and adjusting the crossovers those two things went like above and beyond what I thought they would be able to like suddenly like the system like had more cohesion than I'd ever heard before like it it was it was wild actually I was really surprised I think I even mentioned it in a video I was like this this like just sounded so much better and I was like is this just like placebo but like my my heights were off like by yeah I was in meters so they were off by like a tenth of a meter or more in some instances and it was it, it was kind of like yeah it took a little time to dial that stuff in you know do a measurement make an adjustment do another measurement make an make sure that you know you're there are ways to calculate it but once you get it dialed in man that was that was like crazy to me i was like wow so really i think after that i i honestly like i could go further down the rabbit hole um but i don't like I, I just need to enjoy, I need to enjoy the system. Now, if I hear something that sounds wrong, then I'll start investigating and that may, me, may lead me down the, that rabbit hole further, right? Yeah. As with anything, <laughs> it yeah. always happens. 
Um, but yeah, uh, I say like as far as diminished returns, um, you know, there's always, like I said, there's always more that you could do, but it's like, is it the, the kind of question you have to ask yourself, I think is, is this, is me tweaking more for the next, like let's say two hours, three hours in a day, mm -hmm. is this going to get me like how much more performance is this going to get me in the long run? And is it worth it? And yeah. is this time cutting into my enjoyment of my system? If the answer is yes, then I, I think that extra one to maybe 2%, probably not worth it to spend that time. That's just me. That's my opinion. Um, uh, it's kind of like overclocking a PC. How long <laughs> are you going to, you know, like at the end of the day, it's like, are you, you're going to squeeze out how much more performance, right? Um, if you just, uh, if you, if you go and do everything manually, instead of like kind of letting it auto overclock itself with like all these modern like technologies that we have there, I'd say for the most part, it's, it's probably like not worth it to overclock for most people. Yeah. Just like, it's probably not worth it for most people to really dive in and, and spend hours and hours trying to like, you know, redo their sub calibration to get like an extra, you know, half a DB at a certain frequency. I don't yeah. like, I don't even think a half a, D, half a DB would be audible to most people. No, because that, that's also what I learned in school is that the, the, human, yeah. the brain doesn't decipher a change in volume unless it's by three decibel increments. So, I mean, you might notice a tiny bit, but it's, you won't notice a significant jump until you go three decibels higher, three decibels higher. So, although um, Joe made a good point, um, speaking of diminishing returns, I find the most noticeable thing with proper calibration is getting the proper target curve for your room and your speakers. Frequency response is king, then proper phase alignment and levels. So, and honestly, like, to also speaking of diminishing returns, that's what's pretty crazy and great about Joe's Magic Beans that's coming out. Um, is that it's it's honestly making manual calibration that much easier because every auto room correction software, whatever you know, Dirac or Odyssey or whatever, what's that target curve based on? Right, it's usually based on some studio or like mixing dubbing mm -hmm. station or something or dubbing studio or whatever, but what joe's magic beans is doing is eliminating that saying nobody's room is the same so we're going to make a target curve specifically for your room mm -hmm. not based on some other studio that's right in right in la or something your specific room has a specific target curve so let's tackle that yeah and so it's it's really simplifying the process of manually calibrating to to just you know i i saw some of the videos that he and technodad were pumping out um where it's just a little microphone attached to his phone and you know he would get the near field so he'd be right by the speaker and then he would get far field and like kind of pass it over the speaker that way and like mm -hmm. It just did uh, amazing things to Techno Dad's system, dude. Oh, the Joe, good. yeah, Joe. If you're still here, I think he is. He's still he's still posting. Um, I would love to check that out if you want me to review it or preliminary, like preview it, or even like if you want help with testing. Um, we don't even have to film stuff for it. Like we could just <laughs> right. no seriously. Like if you need like yeah. a beta tester or quality assurance, like hit me up, man. Like, we'll, uh, I'd love to like, you know, kind of have a hand and making sure that this thing when it goes out is like the best it can be for people. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have any money to invest, but I can invest some time and, and help you out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I did my taxes, so all my money just went away. Yay. Um, <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, 
a hundred percent like agreed with all of those things. Like there's, there's so like people just kind of gravitate towards frequency response. Right. Um, and because it's just a, it's such a visual thing, right? Like you could visually see what your speaker's doing at a, at a glance at an instant. Um, and I think that that's far more easier for people to read than looking at a fate. Like what, what is phase alignment? You know, they may not even know they may need to go down to, you know, uh, do some more research on like what that means. Um, what's time alignment even like what, like there's so many, like what are like, um, you know, wavelets and all the, all these things. How do you read like an RT 60 graph for like room reverberation? It's like, mm. there's a lot to this stuff that yeah. I think is probably like, you know, I'm not saying this to be like mean or anything. A, a lot of folks out there just don't have the desire to go into it. Right. Like, yeah. and that's completely okay. Like there, what I love about this hobby is like, there's, you can go as far into it as you want. Right. Mm -hmm. You want, you want more, like you want better sound, more better sound. You want better sound. You want, you want to learn like about room acoustics and stuff. Then yeah, you like, you can like, there's like, dude, there's so many like resources out here on the internet these days for free that like, Anybody who's like, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about going to film school or something. I'm like, why? You know, like, <laughs> don't do not do it uh, unless you really need the networking. Like, don't, mm -hmm. it's really like make a short movie, spend, spend 10 grand and make a short film and you'll learn more doing that than you will going to film school. And this yeah. is someone who went to film school saying that. <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, so yeah, I mean... I think there's so many like avenues that we could go with this, uh, you know, with, with, especially with like, kind of, I don't want to get too far into the AI discussion, but like, there is a possibility that I could see a future where AI handles all of this. For sure. Like, I mean, my wife and I just started using mid journey today to make some stuff for uh, a book we're making. Oh, cool. A book we're doing. And yeah. um, you basically can get anything out of it, but you have to know what to feed it, right? Like you, like basically you could, you know, in the future, tell an AI to model your route, like model your target curve after this or blah, blah, and it will handle everything for you. And I think for a lot of people that act actually will be very beneficial because they'll be able to, to get, somewhat pro level results without a pro <laughs> you know mm -hmm. what i mean um but then again you know a lot of people don't really want to spend the extra time to do it and that's okay too like as long as you're happy with your system at the end of the day that's all that matters but if you're one of those people who are like i think i could squeeze out more performance than like you know going kind of like the manual route and or not even manual route going the the you know dabble your feet into kind of tweaking some things post odyssey and everything um, I think that's like the next logical step there. Um, that kind of got off on a tangent there, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, as, as we do, that's what we do, right? Yeah. Yay. No, um, I could totally see something like the Apple Vision Pro headset. Um, mm, I could yeah. see something implemented with something like that, where like you basically have this virtual assistant that just like appears in your room. Yeah. And just like kind of walks you through all the steps and makes all these calculations and stuff and does its magic and then boom you've got a system yeah. that sounds calibrated specifically uh to your room and dialed in and sounds amazing yeah so i totally see that um willie actually had a good question here um are those little odyssey mics that are supplied with the receivers definitely up to the job i have to assume they are but the cynic in me does wonder um this is actually something i've been toying around with lately um so i'm assuming you're talking about the eiffel tower mics the kind of ones that are like that right not the older like if, if we're talking about really old receivers they used to come with like a little puck um, yeah. and those were garbage those were like if you still have a receiver and that's the mic you have those are like that's you don't even have odyssey just forget you <laughs> forget you have yeah. it they they're i don't think that they're they're any that's, good that's actually what what came with the uh iota avx 17 and also, oh, really the little puck uh, the emotiva mc1 because uh, those oh. those two preamps are 
almost virtually identical. Yeah. They obviously Unless have they've... a little bit of different stuff internally. Yeah. But, yeah. Unless they've changed it, the puck mics have you been universally like panned because they're just kind of garbage. Um, I will say though, the Eiffel Tower mics aren't that bad. Um, you can actually, if you follow Obsessive Compulsive Audio File, he has a way to download a calibration file for them that you could literally plug that mic into your computer and use it in REW. Um, Odyssey actually sells a calibration or a, a one of those mics. I can't remember the model number with a cal like that is calibrated like in their factory. Um, they're sending me one along with like multi EQX um, to kind of do tutorials and stuff with. So that should be interesting to kind of. But the, the fact that they're sending you one, because you did, uh, when you, I know the Denon you have currently was uh, used, but did yeah. it still have the microphone? Yeah, the it came with the mic. I used it. Yeah, I used it with the a, Eiffel Tower one, right? Yeah, but this so, is a calibrated one. So like, that's just a stock one they throw in the box, right? Because I think have, that's what the question is asking, is, is the stock one up to snuff? Compared to the one that Denon is actually sending you. Okay. Well, um, just from the research I've done, because I don't have it in hand, yeah. um, I will be comparing it them to each other. I might even do like a full video on like comparing the two mics um, to see like the differences. Yeah. Um, just from the research I've done, uh, they're really kind of within a one to two dB range of each other. Um, for most people, the difference will be negligible if it and also if you're using multi eqx with uh with remy q wizard sorry and because there's basically the way you do it is you you initially do one single position measurement with the eiffel tower mic right just to get something into multi eqx you don't even use those measurements for anything like the, uh, other than maybe you could try to have it set your distances or whatever but you can still manually change those um, you get that in there and then you actually measure everything with the U-Mic and REW. And then you send like basically target files from REW. You save those out of there and import them into a multi QX. Um, so you essentially negate the need for a, a Odyssey mic, hmm. um, which is, which is fine because you know what you're getting with the U-Mic and with the Odyssey mic, you might not necessarily be getting the best that you can, but. Yeah. Um, from actually everything I've read, the Odyssey mic, even like even the uncalibrated one, is pretty close to the U mic one. From what I've read, again, that's what I've read. That'll be I'll be curious to kind of see and compare those, yeah. um, together. Uh, but yeah, I I would say they're up to the task. Um, you know, even if you're doing like multi EQX or even using the the editor app, um. The real limitation there with like the editor app is like not being able to really adjust the curves um, optimally or like you can't really, there's not a whole ton of granular control with that. It's kind of like, it's really hard to get that curve where you want it. Yeah, there are ways to kind of uh, go around like a workaround. So you could use like a tutorial from uh, obsessive compulsive audio file. Or you could use a little program called Rat Rat Buttacy, something. I think that's what it's called. It's literally like a free. Th yeah, I think that's what it's called. But like you can go in and, and change the target curves. But like I've never really had great luck with it. So, um, but yeah, I hope that kind of answers your question there. Sorry, that, that's a long response. Um, Thanks. Let's Willie. see. Thanks, Willie. Uh, let's see, Jeffrey. I think he he. Bounce that, but we'll kind of answer this question anyway. If I have all SVS speakers where they're one inch aluminum dome tweeters, is there a typical tar target curve that I should try for those higher frequencies? Um, technically, no. Um, like we were kind of going on and on in the uh, comments there, it's kind of more about your room and your preferences. If you're finding yeah. them too bright, yeah, like they're kind of harsh, um, you may want to try a curve that has lower. Like it maybe has a roll off or or not even a roll off like a that just doesn't have as much high frequency information, right? Yeah. Like, um, that can be a problem. 
for some people like Klipsch. Yeah. I have a like I have a hard time with those <laughs> at high yeah. volumes because they just even though my hearing isn't great, those those piercing highs, man, can be literally piercing. Um, yeah, those copper woofers, man, and those and those horn horn loaded tweeters. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, do you have any, like, that's kind of my only recommendation is to try a roll off. Um, if you find them too bright, if they're not bright enough, then something's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> uh, typically yeah, for that, speakers like that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause uh, they're just naturally, they're going to be brighter. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, it, yeah. Like Brad was saying, not necessarily like a hard roll off, but at least little bit of a dip in those high frequencies yeah. compared to the, compared to everything else yeah uh, let's see i think I, there was a, one other topical question i was going to answer there before going back to the the fun roomy q wizard measurements um Oh yeah, Kevin Gardner. That's that's the one. I know he just dipped out too. He's going to watch a movie. He says, "Guys and gals, let's not forget about the room and speaker placement before calibration, especially with subs. I'm still trying to figure out the best spot for my subs, and could not agree with you more, man. Like that, that will make or break a system. Now, obviously, um, you know you're limited by your environment and that you're putting the subs and speakers in. So, you know, in the case of me, I don't really have many places I could put the subs." other than where they are. So they're just kind of like, yeah. you know, um, they're going to be where they're going to be. Uh, but a great way to do, uh, to figure out where the best place is, is to literally, um, I think I've made a video about it, uh, literally do measurements in REW and mark those places on the floor of where you measured those subs. And the great thing is, is once Sub you do- crawl, is that what it's called? Yeah, but like you're not using your ears, which they can, that, that's the big thing. It's like your ears are great, but they can lie to you a lot, right? Yeah. Like, you know, you get used to the way something sounds. So you can use the measurements and just move them around the room and move the subs around the room. And typically, um, regardless of like the sub brand or whatever, um, outside of like the capabilities of the sub, if you find a spot that is fairly smooth, then any sub you put there theoretically will will carry that same frequency response um within that like what you measured so if your sub only does like let's say 25 hertz to 140 hertz if you get a, if you throw a sub there that goes to like 15 hertz then the you know it may not be as flat because like you didn't have anything that was capable of capable of that at the time so you may need to kind of move things around a little bit and figure out you know can I get this flatter or not? Um, but a general like ballpark way is to is to do that, and that's what I've done in the past where I had more room. Is you'd be surprised at how, uh, you know, the front corners of the room and the rear corners of the room are not the best places for the subs most of the time. <laughs> you know, um, they kind of get them out of the way, which is cool, but um, yeah. they're not the best for uh, for base response. So hopefully that because typically. Typically, what you're trying to find is the flattest, yeah, the flattest frequency response possible, uh, without obviously any nodes. Nodes, or, yeah, and that actually kind of answers that question from Lifestyle Travel there, or who asked earlier about base nodes when using uh, two subs. Um, placement, placement, placement. That's the only really easiest way to negate those base nodes. Um, I have a I have a node in my front left sub that I can't get rid of because of the placement. I can't really move it. Um, it's like a probably about a five dB dip. Mm. But I have four subs, so it's not yeah. really an issue. Um, but if I do just if I just had two, like if I just had two front subs, then it would be an issue because it still shows up. Yeah. Um, with those front two subs, so um, I would probably have to experiment with placement than if i just had two subs but having more than two definitely helps iron things out um kind of the whole point of them um or one of the points you know smoother frequency response across the listening area uh, so yeah like and because bass is typically omnidirectional if you as long as you don't if you're not 
you don't have like super small satellites and you're crossing over at like 150 or higher, <laughs> you know, 250, um, then uh, yeah, you're pretty good. You're pretty good with a with a multiple sub placement or multiple multiple subs, and one's have like basically one has a little dip and the other one doesn't. You're pretty much going to be okay uh, most yeah. of the time. I mean, with two, if, I mean, if you have the room and it's not like you know directly in some sort of walking path, I mean, just try and maybe they go better on the sides of the couch or behind the yeah. couch instead yeah. of up front. Um, so yeah, just yeah. if you've got dips, then experiment yeah. with the placement itself. It, easier said than done, I think, right? Yeah. <laughs> because if you have bigger subs that weigh a crap ton, then it makes it harder. Yeah. Um, you know, take the yeah, take the feet off if you have feet on them, spiked feet or anything. Take those off it may, and take off the front grill. It makes it so much easier to kind of slide around the room, right? Mm -hmm. um, thankfully, we're not doing the actual sub crawl, which was required requires you to put a sub like in your listening position, so like on your couch in your theater seat or whatever. We're not doing that, you know. Thankfully. Whoa. Yeah. Um, that's what I used to do back <laughs> in the day. And you'd kind of crawl around on all fours and you'd mark the yeah. spot with a piece of tape where it sounded the best. And then, you know, then it's, that's where you put your subs. But yeah, we've kind of with, with, you know, you mics and measurement mics and all that stuff in Rumi Q wizard, it kind of, um, not necessary to do that anymore, thankfully. Um, yeah, but yeah, still yeah. it can be time consuming because then, you know, you could do a crap ton of measurements and be like, position two front wall is the best you know or whatever like it's <laughs> um yeah so uh but yeah so i guess uh we'll dive uh back into this real quick uh did you have any comments or questions elon about this what we're talking about so far uh no i mean I, i've no? already asked if something has come up i've already blurted it out okay <laughs> so and yeah like like i said if we uh uh if there's any part in here, let me uh, let me open up. There's way too many measurements. I should have went through all these before we did this. Um, <laughs> I was like, "Holy crap!" Uh, let me just open up the sub. So we'll we'll kind of just I want to touch on subs real quick, just because. Yeah, for sure. Subs are a little easier to kind of look at because there's fewer. Typically, we don't have like, you know, oh, <laughs> eleven like 12 channels essentially you know with the sub so yeah. it kind of makes it a little easier um to see let me highlight this here ba -da -ba -da -ba -ba. bam look at that there we go it even switched our positions on the screen that's great wow. i'm now on the right i don't care it's fine uh so okay so we're gonna uh just kind of look at the look at a few measurements here um, so this is at this point, this is this from a while ago. I was um, targeting like a flat curve. I'm just going to hit this button so we kind of fill the screen here. It's a little easier to see. Um, so I have four subs in here, right? And this is before any type of like time alignment. It's actually not too bad, but like there's a ton of like issues, uh, mainly like this massive dip here at around 100 and, uh, 110, 115 hertz. Yeah. Um, yeah when you have four subs you know like you, 10 db what is that yeah so we're looking up here um uh, where should be around like if we're trying to match this yeah. like 85 ish mm -hmm. and then yeah we're right at like 73 so it's t you know 11 12. <laughs> yeah it's quite a bit quite a bit right yeah. so um yeah this is where kind of time alignment comes into play mm -hmm. um tremendously uh you know, if we look kind of also like down here, I'm literally pointing to the screen with my finger. I'm like, you guys can't see that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, if we look kind of down here, um, you know, we also have kind of like a roll off uh, here. Now, technically, um, if we look at the different subs, uh, the front left and front right, you could see that, yeah, I have uh, a dip. Like, this is weird. I don't. What's weird is when I remeasured this a, a couple days ago when I was doing another calibration, um, I don't have this this kind of dip the in my front right sub anymore. It's weird. I don't know what happened. I didn't move the sub. Oh yes, I did. I moved the sub up six inches. That's right. Oh, there see, you go. there you go. That that shows you right there that if you know all you have to do is 
move the sub slightly and you can get rid of this. Um, unfortunately, my front left still kind of looks like this. But um, yeah, where, what frequency is that? That dip? That dip in the front right was at six to sixty hertz, and then um, fifty hertz. So the sixty hertz one is goes from sixty eight should be up here around um, seventy seven point five six. And you notice they're yeah. actually relatively flat here outside of that though i don't know if you yeah it's pretty good kind of see that um yeah i actually <laughs> i've been doing this thing um and people can comment and and tell me how wrong i am for doing this um these are svs subs they have three band parametric eqs so i actually use the three band parametric parametric eq first to reduce any high peaks I don't i don't boost anything i just like say like maybe there's like a massive peak here i just i use the the parametric eq to bring that down make it flat that way mm -hmm. i'm not like i like each sub is kind of playing the same exact thing right not mm -hmm. one sub is boosting anything further but or, or yeah one sub's not like 6 db higher i don't ha i couldn't find any uh, of the measurements that i had before that but yeah, I, I typically kind of do that if I have the ability, just because um, for kind of like critical low frequencies like this, doing like a just a simple like cut, you're not really going to hurt anything. You're not overcorrecting anything there, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the trouble you run into is when you start boosting things. Like if I try to boost this area here up, then that's going to maybe cause an issue because like we're, yeah. we're trying to, we're trying to boost it, you know, Whatever that is, six dB, ten dB. Um, yeah, what is that? Uh, Sixty-eight point five to seventy-seven point five. So yeah, what about nine dB? Yeah. It, like that's that's not fixable by a boost. Anything, yeah. basically, if it's anything above like two or three dB, I typically don't try to boost it ever. Um, because that's the that's the rule of thumb too. Is don't exactly boost, only cut. Yeah, yeah. Um, sometimes you have to boost a little bit and you want to keep it you want to keep those margins really low there because you can get into trouble if you're trying to boost something like by 10 db or something typically if it's like a db or two you're probably okay yeah um but yeah so those are the front rights and together you can see these are timelined um that's that's about as good as they can get like and by timeline i mean they they require no alignment um mm. with each other because they're they're both like they're they're yeah just they're all they're already phase aligned with each other um the back left by itself really bad um <laughs> you can see like this is in the back left of the room we get a massive suck out um but then we we uh align it together again this is older um i don't know what i was doing here i don't know why that's like that should have looked at these first but you know what <laughs> it's live who cares yeah. who cares um this is all the experimenting i do off camera if you guys wonder why videos take so long because I sit here for hours <laughs> and just do this. Um, so yeah, the, basically the, the whole point is we want to, we want to try to get as much positive um, summation, meaning that as we add subwoofer after subwoofer, we want, we want this level to go up as much as possible while also not creating massive dips or anything. Mm -hmm. And so if we actually look like this is the time aligned response, and this is before the time aligned response. So we did lose a little output, but it's a much flatter overall response, yeah. you know? And then when we finally EQ it, I mean, that's like, I didn't, I didn't bother like trying to do like super flat EQs here. Um, sure. This may, have, this may have even been, I can't see, oh, this is just a center channel. Um, I was checking my, uh, like where the crossover was. Um, but yeah, so that that is kind of just a rundown of like why it's so important to calibrate your subs and to time align them. That's like the main timeline, it, it, like time aligning your subs is like kind of the biggest benefit that you could do with like a mini DSP easily. Although yeah. with like more recent subwoofers and stuff, it's much easier uh, or not subwoofers, um, uh, receivers, it's much easier to do all four subs like that right like it's you don't have to you really don't need a mini dsp and actually i am working on a video whereas if you're if your sub has like a parametric eq even if it's like three band preferably more would be beneficial but even a three band eq can kind of get you pretty close to a mini dsp without spending the extra 
you know, two or three hundred dollars. Um, yeah. So that's another tutorial I'm working on too, because hey, you know, it if it saves people money and they get more performance. I mean, even Joe awesome. said pre EQ using the SVS three P, you know, parametric EQ is a good idea because it's three extra yeah. bands. Why not? Yeah, yeah, and I I just sort of toying around with it, and I was like, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna cut anything. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I mean I'm not gonna boost anything. I'm just gonna cut. I'm just gonna remove those massive peaks that can happen when you put a sub in the corner of a room, right? Like yeah. it's. Like you're you're getting like that speaker bound or like the subwoofer boundary uh, reinforcement, so it's really kind of like hitting on some some notes there, that uh, it's just really kind of boosting that stuff, and yeah. you don't necessarily want that, and it's just kind of muddying your sound to a certain extent. But also, since you're using a mini DSP, why not, right? Like you, it's like Joe said, it's an extra three bands. It takes a little extra time. But guess what? You pretty much do it once and you don't move your subs. You'll never have to do those PEQs again as long as you don't right. like muck it up the first time, yeah. you know? Um, but yeah, so just that right there, I mean, is a massive, uh, like a massive improvement in sound overall um, without having to really touch your speakers. Now, obviously, that's independent of, uh, you know, running Odyssey and stuff. Typically, um, you want to do all that stuff before you run Odyssey. But the great thing is, is when you do that, again, you do that once. And then, yes, you may have to adjust the, the volume of each sub through the app. But as long as you have everything dialed in, you bring the subs like down one by one, each sub in like equally. It's really like it's it's I mean, it's super easy. Like you. It, the, the thing is, like. Most I, most people, I feel like, in my opinion, could benefit the most from like proper sub time alignment and and yes. EQ, right? That's that's why a lot of people recommend don't don't EQ anything above three or four hundred because the low frequencies need the most help in most yeah. systems. Yeah. Um, whereas you know higher frequencies, uh, most of the time are okay for most people. Hmm. Um, I will show you uh, mine here in just a moment. How are we looking on comments? I haven't, I haven't been keeping up. I've been letting you take the reins there. I've, been... I've gotten a few starred. Um... Oh, here we go. Yeah. Okay. So I'm not completely out of my mind using the, <laughs> the PEQ. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know you you do read a lot about people. It is possible to overdo EQ. It's it mm -hmm. definitely is possible with multi EQX. Uh, Joe can actually attest to this. Uh, multi EQX updated, uh, like was updated uh, recently. I don't know how recently, but you can actually stack multiple EQs on top of each other, and they'll keep EQing. Oh wow! So like, yeah, while your frequency response will look super flat, um, and I tested this just on my center channel because I didn't like want to. I was just like curious, like. How yeah. crazy can you go with it? It's like right. I EQ'd the speaker three times. I'm just curious. Don't ever do this, right. by the way. Right. I was doing this as a test, not re recommending this at all. I EQ'd the speaker three times, full range, twenty to twenty thousand. Right? It the the graph was about as flat as I've ever seen it. Mm -hmm. Right? Like that frequency response. It sounded so awful. Like you could hear, <laughs> you could hear like. Like I didn't even turn it up loud because I was afraid of damaging it because it yeah. I was looking at the boost and it was boost because I was just messing around again. Don't do this. It was boosting sometimes 10, 12 dB on one EQ and then like four dB on another. Oh. And then like a like three. So it was like sometimes it was like a 20 dB boost, you know? Dude. It like it literally like all the resonance in the speaker came out. All of the like you could just it sounded so unnatural mm -hmm. that again, someone mentioned earlier, it's like you can people people do focus on getting that curve to be like as flat as possible at the expense of it sounding natural and that's something mm -hmm. where i'm like really unless you're targeting like certain low frequencies when you're stacking eqs like you know say like you have a really bad a nasty boost or dip or something like maybe you have like a 2 db dip at like 150 hertz then you could target that specifically don't target the whole range just target that bring the, yeah. try to get that back up 
and go light on it. Like don't don't try to overdo it. Just try to target that, fix that, and then maybe there's one or two other areas where you might need to boost like a DB or so. But if you're needing to boost six DB, it's probably not even worth doing, you know. Yeah. But like those little things, like that's fine. But <laughs> yeah, don't do what I did and just EQ the whole <laughs> thing. I was like, dude, this looks so like the the response looks so good and it just sounded so bad. Yeah. Sounded so bad. So just because you see, that's another thing. Just because you see a flat line on your response doesn't mean it's going to sound good or right. Mm -hmm. um, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yes, exactly. And, then, and that that kind of goes along with the fact that, you know, speaking of acoustic treatment, uh, you know, again, since I come from the music mixing world when for audio engineering, mm -hmm. that's when you want to have like the flattest, most dead room possible so that you aren't hearing any coloration whatsoever. So you're just mixing pure frequencies, right? Right. But in a home theater, you want your room, your room has character. And so just like EQing too much, if you put too much acoustic treatment up, it's going to deaden the sound too much. Right. And then your AVR is going to be working too hard to combat the fact that there's virtually no reflections. You still yeah. want some reflections. Some, yeah. You know, you want to have some acoustic treatment in like, you know, the, the most problematic areas, but that doesn't mean you want acoustic treatment like everywhere, everywhere like an anechoic yeah. chamber. Right. And I mean, I, you know, for all intents and purposes, my room is too dry for, for most people. Um, yeah. But uh, it's, it's not, it, it's slightly below the tolerance of what is acceptable for like having a room true too dry right like it's not like so low where it's like you walk in and there's no room rever reverberation at all there's still some but it's on the lower end like it's just kind of outside of that acceptable range could i go in and add some diffusion sure i might play around with that one day um but i'm i've not ever been unhappy with the results like it still yeah. sounds very good like it's not, everything sounds very tight like it sounds great um, especially coming from like a completely untreated room. Yeah. It's a damn massive difference. Um, but yeah, you don't want to go too far with that. And I think that what what happens is, and I have a friend of mine who 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 just like he's like, Yeah, I just I like the way the acoustic panels look, so I got more. <laughs> it's like, okay, did you consult anyone? Because he his room was designed. His room was designed a certain way. Yeah. And he just started throwing acoustic panels in. And I'm like yeah, but dude, you're kind of throwing off the balance of like what, like just because it looks better, like I don't think you should just like throw stuff willy nilly in the room now just because you yeah. can. But you know, it's his system. It looks cool. Hey, man, it looks good. Looks good. So I'm just deleting some of these measurements while we while we chat here because I'm like, uh, we, this is too many. Um, <laughs> yeah, Joel makes a good point. Like Gramani said, a little salt and pepper makes it taste better. Too much yeah. makes it worse. Yep. Yeah. So too and much it's, anything. Is a yeah. Thing. Too much bass. Like there's there's some bass heads out there that I'm just like, I like to hear. Like I like to feel the bass, but I don't like it to be so overpowering where it detracts from the actual like thing I'm watching. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if I could, like, I don't want to. I don't want someone to slam a door and then I feel that door slam unless that's the intent. Right. Yeah. Um, if it's like, you know, an Edgar Wright movie, then yeah, the door is going <laughs> right. to like have like a massive low frequency hit. Yeah. But like, if it's someone just like, Oh, I'm pissed, slam the door. You probably, it's just going to be like more like mid to high frequencies than, than low yeah. frequencies. Right. You know, unless Jason Voorhees is walking towards me, I typically don't, expect to hear footsteps coming out of my subwoofer you know <laughs> like or, or godzilla or something you know clip clop clip clop yeah that's actually a really really good uh aa says it should immerse you in the scenes not jolt you out 100 percent. i agree yeah. um 
<laughs> which is which is partly why I, I I like have trouble sitting through a whole D box movie. <laughs> well, it just yeah. jolts me out of the seat like every time. <laughs> what? Whoa! Speaking uh, of ground note, <laughs> hey, whoa! When I yeah, I'm not gonna go there. <laughs> <laughs> I, had a, I had a I had a thought that just uh, definitely definitely a late night stream. Um, <laughs> late late night stream thought. That's that's what it is. But um, okay, I'm I'm ready maybe that'll one. be our next T-shirt. Hey man, late night. That's true. Off. Yeah. All right. So let's. Uh, I'm gonna share some of these real quick. So I'm just gonna show you. Basically, this is these are gonna be my uncorrected measurements in my room, okay. versus my most recent corrections that I've done with uh, multi EQX and the target curve. This um, is all your speakers playing at once. No, this is each individual one. Okay. So, yeah, uh, I'll just show you real quick. Uh, and again, I'm just, I'm still learning multi EQX. I haven't like spent a ton of time doing this stuff. So I apologize. So here's the target, the the target that I was trying to get each speaker to. Um, and so what, here, let's, for those on the podcast. Yes, thank you. There's a red line. <laughs> <laughs> um and so these are just the like my front left is this is the og measurement the something i will note here is um the measurement of just that speaker so these these aren't this is not a scientific thing i'm just gonna say that um yeah. this is a single position central listening position the corrected measurements i'm going to show you are uh, an average of three different measurements across my listening area. Hmm. So there's three different positions that are averaged. Um, so like if we look at the original versus the uh, the front left averaged, so you can see, um, yeah, not not much in the way of boosting other than Is like there right here. Three different microphone positions. Yeah, yeah. So it's basically the central listening position, which is the, the considered the main listening. Yeah. There's one that's about uh, a foot to the left and one about a foot to the right. So okay. um, if you imagine two seats, one's in the middle of the headrest, one's on the head, like on one headrest, or I'm sorry, one's in the middle of the uh, armrest, right? Yeah. One's in the middle of the right, uh, or one's on the uh, the right seat like where our ears are and then one's on the left seat so it's an average of that area um but uh oh thank you joe i appreciate that <laughs> it says what i uh, for those listening uh it says what i respect about brad is he's willing to take the time to experiment and learn for himself that's really um what it's all about for me um this is a uh, like yeah, I, I can watch so many tutorials, but I'm I'm like a hands-on type of guy. I like to dive in and learn by doing. Um, yeah. Thankfully, with like multi EQX, I found it outside of so like some quirkiness and trying to figure out like what the hell's going on. Like, why are they doing this? What's why is this happening when I click this? Um, it's pretty it's pretty straightforward. Um, I was actually really surprised me. Um, and Joel, this is, uh, for those listening to, to answer Joel, uh, the measurements are psychoacoustic smoothing. Um, I just find that that's kind of more representative of, uh, how things sound. I will say that I think the subwoofers don't have any smoothing applied, um, cause I typically don't do smoothing on how subwoofers. How do you apply psychoacoustic smoothing? You just tell Rumi Q wizard to be a psycho acoustically no um you basically there's a couple ways so like if i go to oh, unselect this this is turning into an rew tutorial thank you elon you're um, welcome so you can go uh like have your measurement selected on the left here go up to graph and then psycho acoustic you can remove it you can do a bunch of different ones so like 148 is another popular one um variable smoothing uh, but psychoacoustic is typically what I stick with. Um, you can also use like the keyboard shortcut. I think it's like Control Shift Y. Uh, but on I'm on a Mac right now, so it's Command Shift Y. 
um, and that will remove it. And these are also using uh, 15 cycles of frequency dependent windowing. And Elon, please don't ask me what that means. <laughs> I don't feel like trying to explain it right now. <laughs> hey, Brad. <laughs> what is frequency dependent windowing? Well, let do you have another four hours? No. Um, but no, so going back to this, so you can kind of see, um, you know, this being an average, um, I don't have, uh, I didn't bring over the the other measurements, but this is an average of the three the three spots. Let me uh, remove this comment too, because it's, uh, it's getting in the way here. Sorry, Joel. Sorry. Um, <laughs> So yeah, this is an average of three responses. And when you measure these three, they are not going like they are not going to look anything like this, right? This is an average response. These are also um, cross-correlation aligned, meaning that they are aligned based on the impulse response. Mm -hmm. So if you think about taking measurements at three different positions, when you go to average them, uh, when you go to average them, remember that because they're in three different positions, they're going to arrive at the microphone at a different time. So you need to account for that to get an accurate representation when you go to average them of the frequency response. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So so basically these were cross-correlation aligned. So they were essentially aligned with each other and then averaged. Mm -hmm. So we've taken the time difference out of the equation. That's all it really does. Right. So we're just averaging the, the the actual frequency responses. So, but yeah, I mean, if, you know, we're seeing this uh, here, sorry for those listening, you can't see this. Um, it's a relative, it follows this line relatively closely. Yeah. Um, you know, and this was just, this wasn't, I really didn't go crazy with any of this. Like I literally just exported a target curve out of, of RBW as a text file and then imported that into um, multi EQX. That's what all this was. But in order to get here to where I'm at here, like the way I EQ'd these was I took those same three measurements of each speaker at three different positions, mm -hmm. average them together after I aligned them, and then EQ'd that instead of like EQing each one individually. Does that make sense? Oh. Yeah. So it's essentially just taking an average of what your listening area and EQing that average instead of just EQing a single point. And so you get a, that would be even more tedious. So I, I get that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I mean, if we look at some of the other ones here, the front right's kind of the same story. I mean, we got a massive dip up here. Um, this is where me just letting Odyssey do its thing. I didn't bother like trying to, limit corrections or right? i just want to see what it could do how quickly i could get this done it took me about uh, an hour and a half to do all 11 speakers not including the uh like subwoofer calibration mm -hmm. so uh that kind of shows you how quickly you can get things done with this whereas like me following the supreme odyssey calibration from oca took me about eight hours total over a day yeah it was a lot of back and forth i mean I was also like running into issues. So like that was part of it, but this yeah. was just fairly straightforward. Um, so yeah, here I didn't, again, I didn't bother doing any type of Schrodinger frequency or Schrodinger, wow, Schroeder frequency or applying any type of curtains. This is just a full correction. I wanted to test that out first and then uh, I'll, I'll kind of mess around with some stuff. But I mean, this, you know, uh, this here, like a lot of the cuts here to the base region because my fronts technically go down to about 35 hertz, uh, 38 hertz, 40, you know, something like that. So that, you know, that goes on there. Again, um, keep in mind that this is, uh, we are comparing a single point measurement, which is the before, which is this guy, the highlighted one here, mm -hmm. um, to a an average measurement. So even with it corrected, measuring the same position here, like right in the center, um, which is what this original measurement was, there is still a dip here, um, if that makes sense. Like it, that has, we're not boosting this here at like 1K from like 60, was it 63 to 73. We're not adding a 10 dB boost there. Yeah. You know, it, it may be closer to like four after the averaging. Because when you when you t if you look at the frequency response of like the right side and the left side measurements, 
they're actually boosted here instead of cut like down here. Oh, right. So it kind of evens out, which is which yeah. is the benefit of taking multiple measurements. It does also mean that you get the best response over a wider area, which is kind of how Odyssey and Dirac and everything work, you know. True. Um uh, just to go down the list real quick here, um, the center was kind of crazy. Um, you know, these were also uh, not. I don't believe any of these prior to this were level matched. If I'm if I'm remembering correctly, no, I think they were. Maybe not. That's way too high to be level matched. <laughs> wow. But I mean, you can see the difference. Like this one right here, the center channel being pretty much the most important speaker of the system. This is the after. So it. it uh, average oh, wow. and pretty far like yeah and you can see though i'm not especially like at the high end i'm not really boosting anything not really uh boosting a lot the only time i think i let it boost crazily was in the back surrounds um but like surround left you know again you know we're kind of just always kind of right on that line or you know the the dips aren't really especially yeah, remember these aren't crossed over at all too. I should mention that these are these are the full like these are what the speakers can produce. Yeah, there's no exactly. sub and it's no sub woofer in play here at all. Right. Um, so like the surrounds go down to fifty. Um, these are right against a wall, so they're getting reinforced base from the rear port on that too. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I would never. I think I crossed pretty much everything over at eighty except for my top uh, my height speakers. Um, but you can see like the, you know the point of all of this here is, um, you know, I like this, the sound of this curve. So I'm, I'm trying to get my speakers uh, each sounding like this. And what, what this does is it creates a balance and cohesion within the system. Now, yes, there are some instances where like, you know, on some speakers, we don't want to like, we're, we might be boosting too much in the highs up here and that's going to cause some issues. You know, we can see actually as I go <laughs> uh, go into the next speakers here. For the most part, the the main five speakers outside the back left and right surrounds are are pretty good. But then, if we look at like the before, and this is hundred percent due to placement. So like, if we look, you see how it just kind of rolls off hard right here. This is a hard roll off here at the upper. Like, mm. um, that's because of the placement. They are not. Um, in line at all with the, the uh, they're not ear height. They're h much higher. I'm boring you to death, Elon. Uh, no. <laughs> Elon's over here yawning for those that can't, uh, that can't see anything. Um, but you know, we're hovering around 53 viewers, which I'm excited about. Like, this is like oh, man. one of the highest uh, that we've been. So thank you guys for sticking around. Um, post your questions in the, in the chat and we'll try to get to them. Um, also, if you're telling, if you see anything I'm doing wrong, don't point it out. Because I want to be perfect. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Point it out so that others can learn from my mistake. Um, I'm definitely not perfect. Uh, I, like I said, I've been experimenting a lot with this stuff, and this is part of those experiments here too. Yeah. Um, so it, I do this so you guys don't have to. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I can bring you stuff in videos that uh, that uh, I've come to on my own through experimentation. But uh, looking at these here. Uh, let me remove this back up a little bit. So this is the one that I kind of let boost. And you'll see that it's it's kind of up there. Like we're going from like 59 um, dB at around, let's say, 17.2 up to, you know, 70. So we're boosting like crazy wow. here. Um, granted, probably not a lot of information getting sent back to these speakers. Um, if these were like the fronts, I definitely wouldn't do this. Like I, right. I, I would definitely limit that, but because there's surrounds, yeah, the idea being here is that they're probably not going to see anywhere near the amount of action that the fronts do, right? Right. Um, and then if we go to the back right, we kind of see the same thing again. This is all due to placement, um, you know, and these actually like it just kind of rolled off naturally. Like the highlighted measurement there, just it was like, yeah, we can't do anything here. Fuck it, we're just gonna, <laughs> we're just gonna let it be what it's gonna be. Um, and now you get to you get to see here why I do the whole frequency range. So here's my top front left. Immediately you'll notice a massive difference between, like, say, 
my front left, which has a natural roll off, uh, like once we get to around 17k, 17,000 yeah. hertz. Yeah. Um, whereas these don't have that roll off at all. No. And reason for that is my main speakers have soft dome tweeters, and these are um, my height speakers have, I believe they're aluminum dome tweeters. Yeah. I believe they're the Aperion Audio Clear 60s. So, right. um, I'd have to look those up. I can't remember what they have in them, but they're very bright. And this is also with the dip switch down on them to reduce the highs. <laughs> uh, it, it's yeah. even lower than it's like the lowest it can. Um, yeah. And so, by doing that, uh, by having them correct the full range, I'm able to bring that down to a more like manageable, right? Like it basically matches with all the other speakers. I, they're not. These really call attention to themselves right here. Yeah. And it gets worse though. Like this is just the top front left. If we look at like the top front right, I believe it's a little higher. Like, so yeah, it gets really bad. <laughs> like, again, I'm just, so like these are, you know, that's been corrected. Cool. Top wow. rear left. Look at that. Whoa. That's insane. I don't know what it's doing back there. That's but on an was, upward trajectory. That's yeah, crazy. Yeah. But I was able to bring it down. And then finally, I think the top rear right might be the worst one. No, it's about the same. Yeah. So yeah. For whatever, the rears are just like pushing those highs, man, like yeah. severely. And yeah, that's that's basically, especially for the tops. This is this is a this is a moment here. This will throw off like you can level match these all you want. You can uh, I'm talking about the heights here. You can level match the heights all you want. You could EQ them up to say like 500 hertz. These are still going to throw the balance of the whole system off because of how hot they are mm -hmm. in the high frequencies. If you don't take care of these, this is this is a this is a moment where I I would go okay, how do I fix this physically? Like, could I do a like? Can I afford to add like a a speaker backer box or something would this help with the high frequencies maybe i don't know um or could i just do this via eq and eq is the simplest route right but i mean look at this we're, we need to be down here at um like 71 db and we're at like 80 and 80 and a half like so 10 db wow. hot that's definitely yeah. going to be noticeable right and then finally we have the sub um which this is kind of like a misnomer here or whatever. This was already done with the mini DSP. Um, I just said, hey, you know, correct the sub a little bit. And that's what I got. I don't, it boosted this up here, which I can easily go in and just kind of fix that and go, okay, I don't want this boosting here. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it did. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's pretty much a relatively flat. Do I have any smoothing on this one? It looks like I do. Why? Or maybe it's, yeah, no, it's, we're good. We're good. So, yeah, this is a, um, so Mike brings up a good point. Uh, Brad, for your heights, your UMIC calibration file should be taken into account. So he's not wrong. So basically, uh, let me get out of this. Hold on. Sorry, Mike. I'm going to answer your question, I promise, or, or address this. Um, yeah, let me remove this. You know, we go. Out of here. There we go. Um, so yeah, so basically for those that aren't familiar, when you measure with like a U mic, you typically put it at like a listening position, you point it straight up. That's typically the way you do it. Yeah. Um what's happening here is the heights are being directly aimed at it. Whereas think about it, your other speakers, they're not like they're being aimed at it, but like because I have the tweeters aimed at the listening position, right? Those highs are hitting the mic directly versus the other speakers that aren't pretty much getting that direct. It's kind of like if I'm talking directly right. at the microphone versus like off to the side, it's going to sound slightly different. Yeah. So Mike, you're 100% correct. And that's what I haven't done yet. Um, so that that is partly why the highs are so hot. Um, but also um, even on axis, uh, measurements I've done for whatever reason, these speakers are just so bright, even brought down. So, um, yeah, I'm going to do some more experimentation, but thank you for pointing that out, Mike, for other people that are listening to this. Um, 
Yeah, because if you're if you're measuring at 90 degrees and you have your Atmos speakers firing directly at it, you're probably going to get some measurements that aren't necessarily the most accurate. Yeah. Um, but yeah, these uh, it's always better to verify like what you're getting. If you're like, what? these speakers are measuring super weird. If you do like an on access measurement, like th like I don't know, like a certain like I don't know, how far would you say you measure an on access? Um, away from the speaker on axis basically me oh, basically I, means well, like yeah uh, like six foot? inches foot something yeah yeah so like basically you you have the mic pointed right at the speaker or the, the you know whatever you're trying to measure um with them being ceiling speakers they're kind of just pointed right at the center about a foot away and uh yeah these speakers are super bright i was like i, I even played with all the dip switches thinking maybe they're just like permanently in the bright area <laughs> right. you know like because they have they have a zero and then like a plus three and then a minus three yeah i know they they definitely are working <laughs> it's just that they're very bright um and not bad at all um uh let's see so that's kind of everything that i wanted to show there um joel has a great question too um says brad i remember you had your speakers uh, crossover around 110 before. Now with more speakers being driven with just the receiver cross at 80, do you hear any distortion when at minus 10 or louder? Um, I do not. Um, I'm pretty, even though I've said my hearing is, is not the greatest, um, I'm pretty like aware of distortion when it happens. Um, and I haven't noticed any. Uh, I do have, I think I have my center crossed over at 90, actually. Yeah, I found that to be the best for the center. Um, but everything else is crossed over at 80, and I think I have the top fronts at 110, and the top rears at 100, and the same, 110. I don't know what I was thinking, 110, what? All 110, um, cause they don't really go much lower than that without like a backer box. Um, but yeah, I haven't noticed any distortion. Um, I do. I am running the sixty, the Denon X sixty three hundred H, and I was running the uh, twenty X twenty three hundred W before. So the sixty three hundred H does have more power. Um, so I'm wondering. Yeah, I mean, but I'm also driving more speakers, so it's kind of offset. Um, I am curious to check out separates at some point. That would be awesome, just to kind of take all of the at least the main channel load like if i get like a seven channel amp that would be super cool to mm -hmm. test that out um i don't know maybe a, a Perian audio will send me one we'll be wanting to check out their seven channel amps for a while yeah come on come on um but yeah thanks again mike i'm gonna have to do some digging into that and uh and see about okay yeah this is see this is what i'm talking about uh, but, it, Joel but i mean because it's you know Measurements are one thing, but it's also what you hear. Yeah. And I mean, you've said that they even sound bright. Oh, they are. Yeah. So if I, yeah, if I just, if I left everything alone, um, with that, yeah, they're, they, the, the, the heights are so prominent that you would think that, uh, they're not like level matched or they're not properly calibrated. And technically they're not. Cause like they're, they like you, like literally like you can hear them all the time it's distracting and that's not what you want out of atmos or dtsx or anything you want it to all kind of blend together and create this yeah. app this bubble of sound and when all you can hear are the heights above you it becomes a super <laughs> difficult it's difficult to listen to yeah. so um, even though even though with the u mic one you know pointing straight up and the atmos speakers pointing directly at it yes that's going to elevate the heights or the high frequencies a little bit but yeah even then yeah. your ears are still telling you that they're yeah super bright so there's still just the character yeah. characteristic of the speaker itself that yeah. you have to take into consideration yeah i might do a video about that because i wonder what the like the decibel difference is between the two because if we're talking like if we're talking about three to four decibels that's definitely you're going to hear that like you'd be able to tell the difference, but if it's like a half dB or a dB, eh. yeah. So if we're yeah, I might ask around and be like, hey, like 
I'm good friends with like Stephen Smith and and stuff and uh, even Joe and and Gene and everything. It's like how how do you guys measure Atmos speakers like from your like with a U mic or something? What are you guys using? Um, because think about this as well. Something to consider, and I don't know if Odyssey or Dirac takes this into account, but you're measuring those speakers essentially the same way with Odyssey or Dirac. You're having they don't tell you to move the mic in a different like a different orientation when you're measuring the Atmos speakers, right? So when you do Odyssey, Correct. they have you pointing the mic straight up. Dirac, same thing. Arc Genesis, fairly certain, same thing. So are they taking that into account within their software? I don't know. Maybe. Be curious to to kind of dive into that more and, and see. That's a that's a very good thing you brought up, Mike. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's a there's a shirt. I'll, I'll have a U mic one pointing pointing up, and it just says straight up, yo. Dude, <laughs> I'm I, I don't even need a shirt. I'm getting that tattooed on my <laughs> chest. You guys, next time I'm on, start a GoFundMe for Brad's tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that don't do that i'm not getting a tattoo don't do that all right so before we before we end it i do want to briefly touch on um display calibration because we didn't i mean we kind of went over mostly audio stuff um which is important but there's also like the display side of stuff and um it basically it, it comes down to kind of the same thing right um, I'm friends with Jason Dustel, who's an ISF calibrator out of Florida, and he is a, like a, a good friend of mine. And we talk a lot, and and basically there is a there's like the difference between like the again same thing with audio, right? Difference between like what they're doing on a studio display when they're color grading the film that you're watching or TV show or whatever. It's always done to a certain standard because it's just kind of how it's always been. Um, but that also means that it's going to look like if, if you, if you took that display or that, that thing that you're calibrated, like you're, you're making on that display, you're that's calibrated and you take it to another calibrated display. The whole point of that is it's going to look the same. If you took it to that other calibrated display again within the limitations of that display right like if it doesn't have as much color volume and hdr then it's not going to look the exact same but it will get close yeah. right and the whole point is you want to take the the all the crazy crappy settings on the display off right, right. like you know like all the the um <laughs> Oh geez, what have I started? Joel, Joel, <laughs> sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Joel uh, <laughs> pitched in five bucks for the tattoo, man. Thank you so much. My <laughs> wife is gonna love it. She's gonna be like, she's like, you keep your shirt on from now on, buddy. You're not sleeping in this bed with your shirt off ever. <laughs> That's so funny. That's so. You should, funny. you should get it. You got a tram stamp of that. <laughs> oh, dude, yeah, that'll that'll look good in the gym. <laughs> I have a home gym, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. Cats will just be like, what's that? Um, so yeah, I mean, but yeah, talking about display calibration, it's pretty much the same thing. There are tools that exist. You, there are certain settings you can eyeball. Uh, there are certain settings that you can't. Like brightness and contrast or test patterns out there for, for like standard dynamic range, pretty much set that stuff by eye. Um, sharpness, you can set by eye. It's when you get into like the grayscale that you really can't eyeball that like you can't like you could select the you know, normally if you go online go to ratings or artings or whatever it's called you can find picture settings and you know they'll be like oh we recommend if you're not going to get it calibrated to set your color temperature to let's say on an lg it's a warm 50. that's going to get you the closest out of the box to like what the standard is for for the the color temperature yeah. um but to actually go in and try to adjust each color temperature by eye, um, I would be willing to bet money that you that there's no way you could do it by eye. It's just yeah, not possible. Um, screw it up. Yeah, yeah. It's it's too it's like our eyes, just like our ears, can lie to us, um, and our eyes are really actually good at adjusting to different types of colors. And like yeah. if, if there's, I mean, you might notice that if you use your phone on night mode or whatever, that you get used to that 
color temperature, right? Your eyes kind of adjust to it and your brain is telling you that I know that this isn't white, but it's white, you know, right. when really it's kind of like an amber. Um, you know, the same thing happens when you're trying to calibrate by eye with those colors, which is why a, like a color colorimeter or colorimeter or however you want to say it, those things exist because they're essentially like you mics for your TV, right? They're, they're literally going to measure light. They're going to measure uh, color values from patterns that you play on the TV and uh, adjust the TV settings uh, to get those within like in line with everything else um, or like get, get them in line with what the standard is. And there's like a bunch of standards. There's like different ways you want to treat OLEDs versus LCDs and things like that um, because, you know, OLEDs can like turn off all their pixels and um, that kind of create like they have a different color volume so that kind of creates a little bit of a uh, you got to you got to treat them a little differently essentially yeah. uh, but for the most part like relatively the same process for both what's great is like with displays these days like a lot from Sony Samsung LG um, you can get something called Kalman home for LG which is like I think I think that's like $150 yeah and then you could buy your own uh, meter off of like Amazon and it could, I think you, there, there's like a few different meters that are supported, but like, I think I've spent 250 for mine or 280, but I used it for um, calibrating my computer monitors too. Cause like color correction and oh, stuff yeah. for photos and, and YouTube videos. Um, but I used it for the TV and basically for, you know, what, what is equivalent of, you know, a little over what 300, $400, um, I can, I can calibrate it multiple times. Um, is it, is it a professional calibration? Technically no, because they use tools that cost tens of thousands of dollars. You know, they use like a Klein K10, which is what my friend Jason uses and far more accurate. So if like, you're really into like the accuracy, then like, yeah, hiring a professional is probably the way to go. Or if you have a friend that is a professional that can kind of profile your meter where you're basically telling it, you're basically creating offsets for the meter you have with like the professional meter. So it's the same accuracy. It's just, you know, it's not the same meter. Mm -hmm. um, then yeah, that's an option too. But yeah, I, I think that uh, display calibration is a little more finicky because most of the time people get it calibrated and they're like, oh, it's too dark. You know, they're not used to the way something's supposed to look. And then yeah. never never mind the fact we have like, you know, HDR is meant to be viewed in a pretty much dark room most of the time. There's like like in a five nit uh area, right? Like it's supposed to be relatively dark. So um yeah, it's hard because how many people in the in the chat here have gone over to a friend's house and it's on vivid? vivid or, or sport or something and it, you right. got they have like motion interpolation cranked all the way up and all you yeah. see are like blocking artifacts around people as they move and mm -hmm. you're like yeah they're like oh yeah yeah we're gonna watch blah 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 you want to watch it and you're like I, I actually gotta work in the morning yeah, no, um i oh, gotta go feed um, my dog yeah so people get used to that though right and so when yeah. You know, if they're not familiar with like professional calibrations, then they're going to get one done. It's going to look way dimmer most of the time, um, uh, like out of the box, unless, you know, the calibrator is really good and they actually talk to you. Like, J like Jason's a really good guy because he'll ask you, like, how do you normally watch the display? You know, how do you normally do this? And, and he'll tailor it to like your viewing environment, which is what yeah. you're supposed to do. Like... Mm -hmm. So, and then you have, you know, different picture modes. So you have like standard dynamic range and then high dynamic range and then Dolby vision. And then all those do technically need to be calibrated on most sets independently from one another. Cause they different like HDR and Dolby vision. They always typically push the TV into like, you know, the brightness is maxed out. Um, and that needs like kind of a different approach when it comes to like calibrating certain like color controls because high luminance is really hard to, to calibrate versus like just standard and standard dynamic range. Yeah. Um, 
but it can make a massive difference. Um, I know on like my LG C1, those notoriously have black crush out of the box and the calibration just completely gets rid of it. Um, it's basically coming out of like zero IRE or like zero gamma, like from the darkest black to like, you know, the darkest shadow, it crushes some of those details in between. Mm. And so like doing a calibration will fix that. Um, and that's mainly the reason I wanted to do it because other, other than that black crush, the, the TV looked pretty good out of the box or so I thought. I wish I had, I don't have the measurements here um, for it, but the, the, the grayscale was all out of whack. It was, mm. it was like pushing too, too much blue and it, yeah, just kind of getting everything in line. And by the way, it's pretty much like a, all an automated process. You can't do the right. manual thing just like with rew and all that stuff but like i literally just like clicked a button and like watched the show on my ipad while it <laughs> while it did it like it, it was it take takes a while it took like yeah i did six picture modes because yeah. like you have to do the game mode on each each picture mode too so it's like oh yeah true my ocd would not allow me to not <laughs> do those six picture modes in one sitting so it took like six and a half seven hours total so for those less familiar what is crushed blacks what do you mean by that uh basically it like is what, what is it what are you seeing when you see crushed blacks it's what you're not seeing really it's it's yeah. <laughs> it's everything in the shadows that you should be able to see that you're not that literally it's instead of like having a smoother like transition from like a gray to black mm -hmm. think of it like this instead of that transition it's just black all of it's black so yeah. instead of having like let's say you have five steps coming out of black you're not going to see four of those five steps yeah it's where just, it should ju it, just just instant silhouette <laughs> yeah yeah and, and watching something like uh game of thrones which is already a super dark show yeah um uh, it, it was kind of a pain in the butt to to watch that show because it was really difficult to see stuff yeah. and so that that can be one of the benefits another benefit is just kind of getting the colors and skin tones right you know um i actually edited a video for audioholics recently and it was it was a, a sony calibration video um with gene and and jason and yeah they i mean everything they go over in the videos is like like i mean jason knows what he's doing <laughs> you know he's talking about the skin tones and everything and it's like that is what like that that is kind of one of the biggest benefits of it and he even says that in the video he's like getting the skin tones right is like because we we see people every single day most of us right like we know i think elon just dropped for some reason he got he got bored with this conversation um something oh he's back hey there he is <laughs> he's like screw you <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I was just saying that, you know, getting the skin tones accurate, like correct and accurate, um, is great is like, it, it, it kind of elevates the set. It, you just know, you're getting the most out of your set when you get like, when you calibrate it, or even if you just do the eyeball measurements of like getting the brightness and contrast and sharpness, like setting correct, that will get you at least 50% of the way there. Yeah. Um, like a lot of people like just doing those little things because sharpness is like one of those things where a lot of people just crank it to a hundred and guess what it's typically not the correct setting for most most sets um i remember getting to this getting into this hobby back in the day and and uh basically zero on the set that i had was correct because it's not adding <laughs> oh, any wow. additional yeah because basically you don't want to add any additional artifacting to it right and anything above zero was adding and it it definitely at first i was like it's kind of soft i wouldn't say it's blurry but it's soft but over time it's like oh wait i'm actually seeing all the like natural detail in the image and i'm it's not like digitally enhanced yeah which is it just everything just becomes like far more natural so um but yeah it, it's one of those things too it's like if you know where the reference point is like with audio then you know what to to do to to get of the picture more to your liking you know some people like a little more color saturation it's not accurate but that's okay like not everything 
not everyone needs a super accurate display unless that's what you're after, right? Right. Me, that's what I'm after. I want it to just look as exactly as a creator's intent. Even if it's like a super dark movie like Arrival, it's going to be super dark. <laughs> you know, there's just like, that's how it's supposed to look. I'm not going to sit there and, and same with like a movie that's like been mixed with like, like virtually no base. I'm not going to go through the hassle of trying to like add base, was that base X or base EQ or whatever, um, to the mini DSP just to improve the base by someone on the internet who's who like added filters to bring the base up because then that's not accurate to the source either. Right. So it's like, you're just kind of putting a band aid on this thing and it comes more down to preference. So I'm like, I'm just kind of one, once I get stuff where I want it, I pretty much never touch it unless I'm like listening to music and then I'll, I might switch over to a different mini DSP profile and, and boost the base a little bit. Cause that's what I like, but overall, yeah. So yeah. cool. Yeah, I think we're we're at like two hours and fifteen. I think uh I think I've I'm gonna be horse tomorrow. I definitely <laughs> I'm led be this, pig. I I, de <laughs> I definitely led this live stream as we talked about earlier. So yeah. Elon was like, as Take you the should because I don't know shit about any of this stuff. <laughs> what is home theater? I'm kidding, guys. I'm kidding. Well, oh, thank you guys for sticking around this was we had like the biggest turnout i think we've had yeah man once that we cool. started so super awesome um i think we answered every question that we could uh i think we're just gonna call it here because yeah. i don't think do you have any closing thoughts or arguments or anything that you want to uh planet of lana video game is now available on playstation and nintendo switch as of today that is fantastic. You guys check that out. It's a very nice game. Um, if you're fans of Limbo, I'm just completely stealing your thunder here. Like you said this in your video, didn't you? You're like, if you're a fan of Limbo or what was the other one? Inside? Inside, yeah. yeah. Inside, yeah. yeah. I've played I've played Limbo. I've never played Inside. Oh, Inside's just that Good. much more. Um, just because it's the successor to Limbo. So oh. they, they got... A little more creative with what you can do with your environment um and it's got uh better graphics um yeah it's really cool oh, it's very dark um not not just not just the look of it but just the the vibe. tone the tone yeah, <laughs> yeah. kind of like little nightmares if you guys ever heard of that game that's some dark stuff in those games yeah. but they're incredibly fun um but, uh, yeah inside takes a weird turn oh like, i need to play like, probably like 80 percent of the way through but it's it's really cool but like no way did i ever see that coming so yeah i I'd Dude, I, it. I need to like i i have a backlog of games right now that i just don't like i, I keep looking at games to buy and i'm like i should i really buy these games but then I'm like, well, only six dollars on Steam. I'll get it. Whatever. I'll just sit there for the next couple of years before I <laughs> get to this game that I probably never play. But uh, but cool. Well, guys, thank you again for joining. Um, I'm yes. I'm hammering away at the revamp edit that's coming uh, sometime this week. Apologies for for being late on that one. Um, just a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes. And yeah, um, lots of tutorials coming. Woo. There might there might be a couple months of just nothing but tutorials coming. Um, hey, tutorials so. are evergreen, man. So. That's true. Multi multi QX mini DSP. The mini DSP is coming. That's the first. Um, yeah, yeah. Gonna do some maybe. Yeah, just just want to get a ton of content out. Um, someone asked earlier um, about M Wave. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to make it this year. Um, yeah. Well. Yeah, Michael, uh, I sent Michael my proposal for, he's wanting to hire me for videography work there. So if that pans out, then I, I will go. But as of right now, I don't have currently any plans. I will be going to uh, Louisiana next month. Hope I can talk about that. Um, cool. For three days uh, to cover with Michael to cover Charlie's dad's theater that he just had built. And Charlie was the guy with the million dollar Star Wars theater. 
Whoa. So that should be pretty fun. That should be yeah. pretty fun. So I don't want to say anything more. I don't want to, I'm currently under NDA. Um, no, I'm not. I'm under <laughs> in the NDA. I'm not super excited about that. So, um, yeah. Thank you again, guys, for joining us. Yeah, and uh, we turnout. will catch you for sure. If you guys watch these um, after the fact, or if you have recommendations for topics you want to see covered, feel free to leave us a comment. Uh, sure. Send us an email. Uh, my email is brad at home theater gamer dot com. Um, and if you have any idea for topics, not that we're running out, but like if you just have something that you want to see covered, yeah. um, send me an email, send Elon an email. And uh, yeah, we'll try to, we'll see if we can get that, uh, if it's something we want to talk about. So, and not, not just audio, but all things cinema too. Cinema. Yeah. Home theater, filmmaking, even. I don't yeah. care. Like we, this is like encompassing our lives, basically. Yes. What, what it's like to be bald. We we'll do a whole stream on that. Elon will shave his head. Yeah, start a GoFundMe Just for that. Just for you, Brad. Just donate your hair. <laughs> anyway, all right, guys. We'll take care. We will catch you in the next stream slash podcast. Bye.